Okay, uh, thanks very much. I'm going to spend about one minute on Northern Ireland. Um, I think probably that's of more marginal interest to most people here. If there are, if there are questions about Northern Ireland, I'm, I'm glad to, to, to take those. Um, I, I have written a, a short blog which is on the university's website about the, the results in Northern Ireland. So I just want to say two things very quickly about Northern Ireland. The first one is that the general election in Northern Ireland did not produce as much drama as elsewhere in the UK. And in many respects, the results confirmed the established voting patterns in the province. Some commentators had speculated before the election that the MPs of the Democratic Unionist Party, which had eight seats before the election and has still got eight seats now, uh, might play a significant role in, in government formation in the event of a hung parliament. This scenario, of course, didn't transpire. Uh, non nonetheless, the eight DUP MPs and the two Ulster Unionist Party MPs, those ten MPs, may still have a significant role uh, as, a, as a cushion, uh, assuming that they are willing to vote with uh, the government over the course of the parliament. So it's not entirely beyond the, the realms of speculation that those Unionist MPs will, will play a significant role. In terms of voting behaviour in Northern Ireland, it continues to be overwhelmingly dominated by the competition both between and within the respective Protestant Unionist and Catholic Irish Nationalist ethno-national blocs. On the Unionist side, that's the Democratic Unionist Party and the Ulster Unionist Party. On the uh, Catholic Irish Nationalist side, that's Sinn Féin and the Social Democratic and Labour Party. Um, and that did not change. Um, the, the results of those two uh, blocks was that the unionist vote at around about 44% of the electorate remained pretty stable, did not change much from 2010. The nationalist vote, surprisingly, declined from about 42% to 38.4%, and that was unexpected. But there was very little comfort for those who were committed to a non-sectarian or, non, uh, or cross-community politics in Northern Ireland. Uh, it is true that the Alliance Party improved its share of the vote to 8.6% from 6.3% in 2010, but if that result cheered those who were opposed to the tribal carve-up of Northern Irish politics, then the fact that uh, the Alliance Party lost its only sitting MP, Naomi Long in East Belfast, uh, punctured any optimism that there, there might be. The fear or hope that some voters in Northern Ireland might prefer a politics of normality by British standards was roundly scotched. So Northern Ireland remains a place apart in UK politics. For example, offered the opportunity to vote for the Conservatives in 16 of the 18 seats in Northern Ireland, only 1.3% of electors obliged. 1.3% across those seats. The cannabis is safer than alcohol candidates beat the Tories in three electoral contests in Northern Ireland. It shows you something about the, the state of politics in the United Kingdom, I think. And I want to, to return to that now and to say in the time I've got remaining, uh, something briefly about legitimacy. Um, because this was a, 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 a discussion that was had um, before the election in the last fortnight, the Conservatives decided to employ what must be regarded as a successful campaigning tactic of questioning the legitimacy of a potential minority Labour administration reliant on the support in Parliament of the SNP. Many commentators pointed out that not only was there no constitutional obstacle to such an arrangement, but that historically there had been several precedents already for such an arrangement. For instance, the Liberal Prime Minister Asquith in uh, 1910 re relied on the votes of the Irish Parliamentary Party uh, and the price of that was legislation for devolution of power to Ireland. Nevertheless, although the tactic worked perfectly for David Cameron, damaging Labour in England, where some voters were encouraged to believe that a minority government led by Ed Miliband would in fact be beholden to either Nicola Sturgeon or Alex Salmond or both, and in Scotland, it damaged Labour also, where appearing to question the democratic credentials of the SNP only served to bolster their campaign to send the Westminster establishment parties a strong message. But in the longer term, David Cameron may live to, to rue the unleashing 
of this genie of legitimacy. Although the tactic may appear to have been a resounding success, it was a highly dangerous weapon to deploy, I would argue. Particularly if we take at face value the Prime Minister's words after the Scottish independence referendum in September 2014. He said then that the UK's multinational union state is an entity precious beyond words. While the tactical victory may prove to be pyrrhic in my view, Professor Peter Hennessy lamented on election night that the tenor of the campaign had been envenomed, uh, sorry, had envenomed the already fragile relations between the nations of the UK, and this was to be much regretted. David Cameron, perhaps displaying an appreciation of the extent of the damage done, claimed in his victory speech at Downing Street that he wished to govern as a one-nation Conservative. Arguably, I think, this blithe response looks either like a shallow attempt to undo the damage of a hugely divisive electoral tactic or a case of self-delusion. From the perspective of many Celtic voters, it does not seem... Uh, it's, sorry, it does sometimes seem as though the Prime Minister really believes that the entire nation looks like his prosperous, complacent Oxfordshire constituency. So for the record, the Conservatives lost badly in three of the four nations of the UK. The party's vote share in Scotland was 14.9%, in Wales 27.2%, and in Northern Ireland, as we said, 1.3%. In terms of the UK as a whole, many supporters of a more proportional electoral system would question the quality of a mandate that the party has won with 36.9% of the voters or 23% approximately of the registered electorate. But in the Celtic nations, this question of political legitimacy is loud and insistent, and I, th I, I would argue will get more so. The Conservatives won 12 out of 117 seats in Scotland, uh, sorry, in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. That's 10%. To put this even more starkly, the party won 842,000 votes in those nations from an overall electorate of 7.6 million. That's 11% of the vote. Leanne Wood, leader of Plaid Cymru, has already argued that the Conservatives do not have a legitimate mandate to implement their manifesto in Wales. And it could be argued this is, still, this is even less the case in Scotland and not at all in Northern Ireland. Therefore, while the election campaign and results may have been greeted as vindicating David Cameron's stewardship since 2010, I think this may turn out to be a short-term triumph. By raising the spectre of an illegitimate minority Labour government supported by the SNP, Cameron also has raised a double-edged sword. The current political dispensation poses profound questions about the union, about the future of the union, as Phil has already said. I think this is most obvious in terms of policy towards the EU, However, it could also be highly problematic if a Conservative government in Westminster sought to implement, seeks to implement a macro social economic policy, especially in terms of further attacks upon the public sector and welfare expenditure that the peoples of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have decisively rejected at the polls. To use the post-election buzzword, if David Cameron genuinely has an aspiration to repair the damage of the electoral campaign, this will require much more than emollient words from the Prime Minister. It needs a significant change of heart and policy in terms of both substance and tone. Otherwise, David Cameron may indeed turn out to be a one nation conservative, and that one nation will be England. And even that will be an England that excludes large swathes of the post-industrial urban north of England, where the conservatives continue to have virtually no support.